Awesome. Guy, thanks for being here. DJ, you should be. Thank you. Always. You doing okay? Yeah. Okay. Quiet week. It's good. Good. All right. Lot, lot, lot to discuss. So let's jump right into it. Um, so for you guys, what's uh, what's due? There's the last two, last project and last uh, homework is out. Um, project four will be due on December 11th. We're, again, we're having the Q and A session tonight on Zoom, as they announced on Slack, because next week's the holiday, and I, I don't, I'd rather get this out of the way for you guys to get started sooner rather than later. Um, and so we'll, again, we'll post that on Piazza afterwards. And then homework five is out as of yet last night, and that'll be due on uh, December 4th. Okay? Any questions about project, well, project three was due last night. Any questions about project four? Assuming no one has gotten started yet. Okay. All right, so this part of the lecture opens up the new chapter of, of now talking about distributed databases. And as I said at the end of the last class, like, we spent the entire semester so far just talking about how do you build a single node database. Uh, and I didn't want to bring any, you know, you don't, you don't want to bring in the distributed, and distributed execution in because that opens up a whole other can of worms that complicates things. Um, so now that we understand how does a single node database work, we can then extend the architecture to now support uh, a multi-node environment. So that's what this class and the next two classes will, will, be, will be about. And hopefully the main takeaway will be just is from, from all of this is that not only are single node databases hard, but they're even also harder if you make them distributed. Um, and so I would just say, oftentimes people, uh, it, oftentimes you're better off trying to make your single node database scale vertically, meaning like getting better hardware and getting faster and faster as far as you can before going distributed. Now replication complicates things and we'll, we'll cover that next class. So if you recall before the midterm, we talked about uh, parallel query execution. And that was about, on, again, on a single node, how do I take a, single query and run it in, in, you break it up into smaller fragments and, and run that in parallel on, on multiple threads and mul multiple CPUs. Um, and so we said this, we had the distinction between a parallel database and a distributed database. And my definition was the parallel database is when the, the execution nodes are physically close to each other, could just be different CPUs on, on the same motherboard. Um, and we didn't worry about the communication costs or the communication being unreliable. Um, but now in a, in a distributed system, all of that, we, have, you know, we, we can't make that assumption anymore. Now the nodes could be physically far away from each other. Like if I send a message or I send a request from one node to another, it might be in the same rack, it might be in the same avail availability zone, it might be the same data center, or it could be in a data center on, on the other side of the planet. Right, so we have to take that, that into consideration in how we design our algorithms and uh, execute queries. So it also may be the case too that like the, the messages we're sending between the nodes may never show up. So we have to be, be aware of that and design for, for that, that, that problem. So as I said, again, this is the, for this point in the lecture, we're going to use the single node databases we've covered so far as the building blocks to now support uh, larger and larger systems. Um, and everything, again, just becomes more complicated, especially query optimization. That was hard. It's harder, like, slightly harder. Uh, but concurrent control is definitely harder, and logging recovery uh, is harder as well. OK? So today, we'll talk about beginning like, the, the different type of system architectures you can have for a distributed database system at a high level. Then we'll talk about what are the things we have to consider when we actually build a distributed database. Then we'll talk about how do we, how do we split things up, uh, partition, partition the data across uh, multiple nodes, multiple resources. And then I'll give a teaser at the end of what the challenges are will be in distributed concurrent control. And that will be what we will focus on uh, in next class. How do we take all that two-phase locking stuff that you guys can implement in Project 4 or OCC, how do we make that run across multiple nodes? Again, and the spoiler is it does, but it's, it's slow and it's hard. Okay? All right, so the first thing we got to figure out is what does actually the system architecture look like, meaning how are we designing the, uh, the database system you know, in the terms of storage, memory, and compute? Where's, where are these resources actually physically located? And that's going to determine what kind of protocols or algorithms we can use uh, and if, when, you, when you run queries and run transactions. And it's also going to have an interesting side effect of determining how we're going to be able to scale our system elastically, meaning add more resources, add more nodes. Right? If, if, if we were running on a single box, a single node system, if you want to add, add more CPUs, we literally have to turn the machine off either you know, migrate the database to another machine that has more CPUs or physically go put more, more CPUs into the, uh, into, into the, uh, to the motherboard. Um, 
Disk is usually swappable. I don't think RAM is swappable, right? But now in, in a distributed environment, especially in the cloud, in theory, that we can just add more nodes and scale it horizontally. Uh, and we want to be able to do this without having to take the database system down entirely. So what the system architecture is will, will determine you know, what are the capabilities and how we actually would want to do this. So there's basically four types of database systems. We can ignore embedded databases. As I said before, these are just, you know, those are like a library you would link in, like SQLite, into your application. And they're, they're running in the same address space in the same process as your application. Um, and you could argue that those are basically shared, shared everything. But you know, for now, we, we can ignore them. We, we don't care. So everything we've talked about so far in this course uh, are, are, are no, what are known as shared everything systems. Meaning like the, the disk and the, the memory and the CPU are all local to each other. And if I want to have, say, two threads running or two queries running at the same time in my shared everything system, then I can just pass memory, you know, messages over memory to each other. Right? If I write any, if one transaction writes something to, to the local disk for the shared everything system, the other transaction can just read that. Right? The next type of architecture you have, now if you want to start have be distributed, is called shared memory. The idea here is that the, the, the CPUs are uh, not co-located, uh, but there's some messaging fabric that allows the, some, some, some amount of memory to be shared amongst all of them. And then the disk, likewise, is also shared amongst all of them as well. So now I could have, like, think of this as two boxes, and any time I want to you know, have one thread and running on one machine, communicate with another machine, they could write to this memory address, and then there's some hardware mechanism that's sending that message over, over the wire to the, to the other node. So RDMA is sort of something like this. What is more common in databases are the last two. Uh, shared disk is when you have separate nodes that are going to have their own local CPUs and own, own, their own local memory. But then the disk will be shared amongst all of them. And again, some messaging fabric, some, something over the network that can take the request to, that from each of the different nodes and send them down to uh, the disk. So again, if, if one CPU writes something to the disk, the other CPU could, could, could be able to see it when it goes and does the read. And then when you think of distributed systems, this is oftentimes what most people think of, uh, what are known as a shared nothing system where every single node is its own, you know, it has its own local disk, local memory, and local CPU. And the only way to communicate between the different threads, or di you know, di different queries running on different nodes, is to send a network message over TCP IP uh, to, to pass it along to, to the different nodes, right? So think of like, I, I buy a whole machine, has, you know, disk, memory, and CPU, and I have multiple ones, and each one is, is its own sort of kingdom. But they can communicate if they go over the network. Right? So you can sort of think of like, I, I'm sure to draw borders, but like, this is like its own node, this is its own node, this is its own node. Uh, wherever the CPU is, that's, it has to be its own node. Right? Yes? Do we assume that the network is reliable in the second and third case? His question is, do we assume that the network is reliable in the second and third case? No. OK, so go over them each, each one by one. So again, in shared memory, again, CPUs are running on separate boxes, but they have ac access to a common address space. And it's soon to be a fast interconnect. It does it, it's not guaranteed to be reliable. Um, like, is the other, the other node that you're writing, reading, writing memory from could just go down, and you have to deal with that. Right? But like, the idea is that like, even though the CPUs may be running on separate boxes, they think or they, they, they believe that they have a global memory address space that they can all read and write to. Um, and so when they boot up, they have to be told, hey, here's the other instances. There's something to tell them. Here's what the, the giant memory pool is. And then the hardware could keep track of how to pass messages around. So as far as I know, there is no distributed database system that actually implements this. This architecture appears mostly in the HPC world, high performance computing world, because they're trying to do like simulations of the, you know, nuclear explosions or whatever on, on you know, terabytes of data. And they need a really large address space for their programs. Um, the one that sort of sort of looks like this is Oracle Rack. Um, and the way that works is the buffer pool. Uh, you have sort of multiple nodes, and the buffer pool has been modified so that the when you read and write pages to it, it knows how to do send that request to, to the different memory locations of the buffer pools on other nodes. 
Um, it's not exactly shared memory because if I allocate memory for my like a query, you know, to to, to fill up a hash table when I'm doing a join, that's local memory and nobody else can see that. It's only for whatever is backed by the buffer pool will be shared across multiple nodes. What is a lot more common is shared disk, um, especially in, in a modern cloud setting. And again, the idea is here is that we have different nodes that they each have their own CPU and, lo and, and local memory. Um, but any time they need to read and write to disk, they're going to go to some central location. And if you're running on-prem, it could be like a, like a NAS, like a network tax storage device. If you're running in the cloud, think of something like S3. Right? And so if they need to get the state of the one CPU needs to get the, get the state of, other, of another CPU, like what query are they running, what transaction are they running, uh, then they have to send messages over the network to like TCP IP which, between them. But again, if one query updates some record that gets written out the disk, the, 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 other, the, other, the other queries, or sorry, the other CPUs could be able to see that because they're always going to read and write from the same disk. All right? So this is super common now, especially in the, in, in the cloud. Um, so pretty much any like modern OLAP system you think of today is going to be using this. Like, like think of this again, as like S3, there's a bunch of buckets. I could have a bunch of compute nodes that are going to run queries, and they're pulling data out of the S3 buckets into their local memory, and then processing them to produce the query results. Now, yes? Would each page be stored as an object in S3, or would you store the entire, because then if, if the entire database is just one spot, you cannot access yeah. the previous location. So his question is, is in, in case in S3, uh, is each page its own blob, or is the giant the entire database is, is, is the blob? You would have like at this level, you wouldn't necessarily call them pages. They might call them like a higher level, like a segment, but might be comprised of multiple pages. Uh, but the idea is that you'd go fetch that like uh, you know ten megabyte of, of chunk of data, comprised of multiple pages, and then run your query on that. Yep. The lines get kind of blurry because there are systems. So yeah, the, the lines get blurry because. Again, this is like, think of the, um, think of this thing as like, it's its own EC2 instance, right? So it would have, you could have locally attached storage, but that locally attached storage could be used as, as a cache, like a, like a fast NVMe drive. Um, but the, the state of the database, like the final resting place of the database has to be down on this, this shared disk storage here. So as I said, this is pretty much every cloud system that exists now today. Uh, for the most part, is, is using something like this. The, yeah, so, so for, for example, how it would actually work. So you have your application server, and say we have two nodes, and then we have our storage. And then storage layer is, is like this own independent thing where, uh, again, different nodes can read and write from it as needed. So uh, my, my query starts. It says when I want to get ID, some, some object ID 101, like some record. Um, so then it has to go down, oh, sorry. Goes down here, it gets page ABC. Again, it's a single object or it could be a, a, you know, a larger object and I had to pull the page out of that. That gets shipped back over to the node and answers the result. This other transaction, the other query shows along says I want ID 102. Uh, so it has to go and get, go to this node. How exactly we find what node has the data we want? We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but the idea is again, it goes back to the shared storage, shared storage device and gets this. All right, so now, the advantage of a shared disk architecture over a shared nothing architecture is that it makes it really easy to scale up with the compute layer and the storage layer independently of each other. Because the final state of the database, like the, the, the state of the database that we want to persist forever uh, after crash and after stopping is always out on the storage layer. So in theory, I could kill off these front end nodes and I, doesn't I don't lose my database. If you ever hear like, when they talk about like, serverless architectures, that's sort of what they mean by this. So like, I can, since this thing doesn't have, again, disk that's it does not storing anything on disk that is the database that we have, we have to persist forever, we can kill this node, no big deal, and then shut everything off. Amazon keeps maintaining my, my S3 storage, and then if I want to run out of the query, then I can spin this node back up, and it can pull pages from, from the storage layer easily. Or if I want to add more nodes uh, without taking out the other ones, so I just pop this node up here, and then now the queries can go to that and, and, you know, and run the same kind of request and get, get results back. 
Likewise, in addition to scaling up the compute nodes, I can also scale up the storage nodes, right? I will ignore this. Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so I want to update. If I want to update here, uh, somehow I know that this node up here at the top is responsible for the for updating this record 101, right? How we get there, how we know to do that, we'll get there in a second. So in this case here, I would go out to disk, update page ABC on LNS3, that's fine. But let's say now that I also know that these other nodes have a cache copy of this record 101. It's to make sure that my they, they have the latest update, I can just send them a request you know, over TCP IP, say, hey, by the way, I know you know something about record 101. I just updated it. Here's the new value. Or you tell them to invalidate it, so then they'll go fetch it again from the storage device. Yes? Yes. Yeah, so his statement is, and he's correct, if, if I always make it so that 101 always goes to this node, then I don't have to do this extra step of telling everybody invalidate. Correct. Some systems do that. Other systems sometimes cache. Oh. Yeah, like a read-only copy. Because then otherwise you would, you would have to do distributed transactions, which makes things harder. We'll get, we'll get there in a second. But you're right. If you don't have another copy somewhere else, you don't have this problem. All right, so the thing I was going to say also, too, in addition to being able to scale up the compute node independently of the storage layer, I can scale up the storage layer as well. Right? I can add more disks. Uh, I mean, Amazon will do this underneath the covers for you. you don't really, it's not something you, you tell S3 to do. But it can make multiple redundant copies. You can increase your provision IOPS, get better bandwidth. You can make the storage layer be faster without, again, changing anything at the compute layer. Right? I'm using S3 as an example. Azure has their own thing. GCP has their own version S3. I forget what it's called. Right? But the, the basic idea is the same. Right? It's like an object store. I can do reads and writes or puts and gets from and deletes. All right, so share nothing is, as I was saying, it's where all the nodes are independent and have their own local disk and local memory. Um, and historically, up until probably the last 10 years, this has been the preferred or conventional wisdom, the right way to build a distributed database system, right? There's a bunch of actually shared disk systems even before the cloud, uh, going back to like the 1980s. But these things are always sort of seen as problematic, and a bunch of them didn't like the products didn't go anywhere. Um, and so everyone sort of said, okay, if you're going to build a distributed database, you would build a share nothing system. But now because of the cloud, you know, Amazon or whoever, the cloud vendor takes care of the storage layer. It's just easier to build, better to build a shared disk system. Again, because you can scale them independently. All right, the basic idea is, again, with a shared nothing system, is that every, every, again, every node has their own, own local attack, di, di, locally attacks disk and storage and memory. Uh, and if I need to communicate between different, threat, between different nodes, I just send messages over TCP IP. Yes? Doing a distributed like storage. Yes. So you're just kind of assuming that like you are, you, they are going to manage it better than you do. Kind of situation. Yes. Right. So the statement is, if you're using something S3, isn't as isn't Amazon managing the disk underneath the covers for you, right? I, I, where I thought you were going to say it's also like replicating and and, and right. all that stuff. Yes. Yeah. And they're, and they're going to do a better job than than you could. But like, isn't but don't we know better about what kind of data we're, we're storing? I see where you're going. Okay, so his statement is that, like, I made a big deal about how the OS doesn't know anything about your database, and therefore don't let the OS manage things in your database. But now I'm saying, hey, if you use Amazon, you can use S3 and let them manage your things about you know, the storage about your database. Right. Uh, yes, you're right, and there'd be optimizations we're not going to be able to do if we use S3, like predicate pushdown. Like, we can't, like, we got to go fetch the entire blob. Of you know, if, if we need a page, we can't do any like filtering where the data resides. We'll cover that topic in a second. Yes, the the difference I think is though it, like at that scale, Amazon is is going to do much better, much cheaper than than you could yourself, right? It's just again like S three is pretty good. It, it's it's slow. It's like 100 milliseconds, 100 200 milliseconds per fetch. Right, that's a long time, uh, and so you wouldn't want to use that for transactional workloads. 
is you could maintain that local cache on the node, as I mentioned, at the local disk, right? But if you want to be able to shut things down, you got to flush it out the EBS or S3. OLAP systems will make, make more use of S3 because it's very, very cheap and, and affordable. The other systems will use EBS. Yes? Yeah, I think you just mentioned that like Aurora was also on the slide of like data, database management. I guess they're using EBS instead of S3 or? Yeah, so go back here. Yeah, Amazon, Amazon Aurora is a, is, a, is a very interesting one. So we can cover this in the semester. But they, Amazon Aurora is basically, they took MySQL, they took Postgres, ripped up the bottom half of the storage layer, took, took the storage layer off, and then rewrote them to be shared disk systems. But instead of just storing things on S3 or, or, e, or using EBS, instead of just storing things on EBS, like every other database vendor has to, would normally do, um, since they control the whole stack, they actually put a little bit of database magic up above, right, a layer above EBS that knows about replication and uh, transactions and, and durability. And so they can actually send messages at the storage layer between uh, different nodes in a way that you and I can't because we don't control EBS. So, so, e, so Aurora, Aurora is a special case um, where they, again, they, it's a shared disk system but to his point, the, di the, the disk layer isn't dumb, just like getting set. It's doing a bit more because it understands what transactions are, what the database is actually trying to do. That's more efficient and you can run like OTP on top. That's more efficient for OTP, yes, yes. Uh, and there's other complications with shared disk as well. Like um, there's examples where people start off with a shared nothing system and they want to say, oh, I want to run it in the cloud. And so they, they, they want to run it in like, you know, in a Kubernetes cluster but like S3 is already replicating and then the system itself, the database system is also replicating. So like, like in Cassandra, it used to be, if I do one update into Cassandra, it would replicate that three, three times in the system, but then S3 would also replicate the, the write three times per node. So it'd be like one write would get written nine times or something, like some crazy number. Uh, because again, they're, they're treating the, the disk as a as sort of a dumb, like dumb object store that only does get and set and doesn't know anything about databases. Uh, they, they've since solved that problem in, in, by just not replicating as much. But to his point, yes, we're sacrificing a, quite a bit of things using shared disk, but the scalability and the cost difference is, is quite significant, so it's worth it. Okay, uh, I think I've covered everything in shared nothing, right? But again, th here's a bunch of different systems that, that all do this, right? Again, pretty much every distributed database written maybe before 2010 uh, would, would, would do something like this, but then now in the cloud, everyone wants to do uh, shared disk. So it would look, so the example would look like this. So now we don't have a shared disk now. Every node has its own disk. And then now I'm explicitly showing what data is actually storing. So we'll talk about partitioning in a second, but think of like it's a way to take a table and we're gonna split it up into separate disjoint subsets. So node one at the top will have all the, all, all the tuples for ID from 1 to 150, and the node at the bottom will have 151 to 300. So query shows up, so it wants to get uh, ID equals 200. Again, we'll cover in a second how do we actually find where to go. Um, and then it knows that this, the data that it needs for this query is located here. So I don't need to coordinate with the other node here. I don't need to go out to a shared disk. Everything I need to run this query is, is local. Likewise, this guy can go up here. He can say, I want 100 and 200. Again, there's some metadata, a catalog where we're keeping track of where, what, what, what node has what data. So for ID 100, it could, it could, get this, it could process this locally, um, but for the ID equals 200, it could either go down here and say, hey, I know you have the record for ID equals 200, send it up to me, or it can say, hey, go run this query for me and then send me back the result. Because again, we wanna have, this, we wanna have the the, the distribution of the data in the, in the distributed database be transparent to the application. So we, I, ideally, we don't want to have to have the application to know 100 is here and 200 is down here because it's send one SQL request to this one node and then the nodes can figure out how to get the, the right result, get the results that it needs and send it back the, the single response. And we want to do this because we do, every time we say a node goes down or we have to like rebalance or whatever, we don't want to have to go change anything in the application. Everything should just work. It doesn't always work out that way, but ideally that's what we want. All right. So now the challenge with shared nothing as opposed to shared disk is when a new, new node shows up or I take a node away, right? 
Because when we officially when we initially boot it up, there's nothing inside of it. So we need to now shuffle around the data from, from the, the, the original two nodes that we had and put something in here. All right, so let's say we just split up evenly. So, so the first guy's got one to 100, he's got one to one to 200, and the last guy's got two to one to 300. So this is hard to do because we want to do this safely. We want to do this transparently, and we don't want to give, we don't want to have a small window where queries show up and you know, it's looking for, for, for ID equals 150, but because it's, it were, we haven't filled, you know, properly initialized this node yet with all the data, it shows up to the first, the, the query shows up to the first node and it says, I don't have what you need because it doesn't know about this guy yet. So you essentially need to do this, this, this migration in the context of a transaction. And in shared disk, you don't have to do that, or you don't, you don't have to physically move data. You just update logical information to say the, no, the, the data you're looking for is this compute node or that compute node. In a shared nothing system, it's physically moving data, which can be expensive. Um, so I would say this is actually one, this, this is sometimes, sometimes called auto scaling um, or elasticity. elasticity. Um, this is actually one of the major selling points, like this, this, this idea of repartitioning and reconfiguring your, your data. This actually one, was one of the major selling points of MongoDB back in the day. I think they still support it. Um, but they wouldn't do it actually in the context of transactions because the early versions of MongoDB didn't have transactions. So like what would happen is you would have these, these, these partition nodes, you would add a new node and it would try to rebalance, but there could be a small window if your query showed up, it would say, you know, it would give you a false negative. Say you didn't have data that you actually had because it was updating things and moving things around, right? So again, so this is not easy to do. All right, so distributed databases are not new. Uh, they go back to the 1970s. Um, probably the first two ones were this thing called Muffin uh, from Stonebreaker, the guy who invented Postgres and Ingress. Um, and this was basically was multiple, multiple instances of, of Ingress and then a sort of a processing layer on top of it. SED1 is oftentimes credited as the first one uh, from, from Phil Bernstein. Uh, this is, there's a bunch of papers that describe all the early architectures of, of distributed databases in, this paper, in these papers. Um, but he gave a talk once where he said he didn't really actually, they actually never actually built it. It was just like a bunch of scripts and it was like prototypes to, sh to get money from the government. Um, but they laid down a lot of the, the, key, the key theory. At IBM, they built a distributed version of System R, the first relational database they built in the 70s called R Star. Gamma was a very influential um, uh, a parallel distributed database out of uh, University of Wisconsin. And then of all these, the only one that's actually still running today is this thing called Nonstop SQL. And again, this was uh, Jim Gray, the guy that invented two-phase locking, worked on System R at IBM. He went to Tandem and, uh, and helped, helped build out uh, Nonstop SQL. Nonstop SQL is still widely used. If you ever used ATM, you probably used it. Uh, Tandem got bought by Compaq. Compaq got bought by DEC. No, no. Tandem got bought by DEC. DEC got bought by Compaq. Compaq got bought by, by HP. So you still can get Nonstop SQL. A lot of banks still use this. But like, if you're a brand new startup, you're not you're not using this, right? But this this is one of the first like. Uh, so so Tandem used to sell these devices or like appliances called nonstop uh, machines or something, and the idea was it was like super redundant hardware. Like think of like NASA level, like where you have like three CPUs running at the same time, and and then you check to see whether they, like, they run some some computation and you check to see whether they produce the same result. So the idea was like it would n never stop, and if you're a bank. You want that, right? So, yeah, it's it's still around. They st I mean, they still make a lot of money off of it, but like it's, uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's pretty much in maintenance mode at this point. But I'm I'm sure the contracts are are in the millions. I mean, IMS, like the first database that IBM built in the 1960s, that's still around. That's still widely used. And that I think it, I remember reading somewhere that's like the number one money maker still for IBM is like IMS. Uh, for all the maintenance fees, because it's like mission critical software that people don't want to change. Okay. All right. So now we know at a high level, uh, like we, you know, we do shared disk or, or share nothing. Um, there's a bunch of these questions that came up when I was describing the different architectures that we had to figure out. Um, and so the first one, obviously, was like, how do we actually find the? How does the application find data? Like, I have a query. Where, where does it go? Right. Uh, and then if the data that I need is not of that query. Or sorry, at that node that I sent the query to, what happens? Right? And I sort of said there was two cases. There is the, 
the query rise at one node, the data it needs is at another node, do I send the query down and get back the result, or do I send the data up and run the query locally? So one be, so it's called push or pull. So you either push the query to the data or pull the data to the query. If it's shared disk, it's always pulling the data from the shared disk layer to the, to the compute node. But in shared nothing, you could choose one versus another. And there's this trade-off, of course, obviously. Like if, if, if the query is like, you know, the SQL string is like 10 kilobytes, but the data I want to scan with that 10 kilobyte SQL string is, is one terabyte, it's obviously better to, to send the query to the data. But if I don't have any comp uh, computational resources where the data is, then I can't do that. So this is mostly an issue with in, in, uh, in a shared nothing system. But even in shared disk, if you have a local attached disk as a cache, right, you still can make that, make that choice. All right, and then the question is, how do we, how do we ensure correctness? If we want transactions, so we update data on multiple nodes, uh, uh, multiple data items. How do we make sure that everyone's in sync and says this is the correct version of, of the data? And then how we divide the data across resources. So we're going to cover all of these except for this one. Uh, we'll cover this in more detail uh, next class. So we'll get into two-phase commit. We'll get into Paxos and Raft and all, all that good stuff. Okay. All right, so the next decision we also make addition is like, what do our nodes actually look like? And it's this notion of like, are the nodes homogeneous or heterogeneous? Homogeneous uh, cluster would be every single node in the system or in the, in the attributed database system is like a first class entity, meaning it can do all the, all the tasks that, that any other node can do, right? It, it, can, it can take any query, it can take any transaction request, it can move data around, right? This is ideal because uh, this, this, this arrangement is ideal because it makes it easier to do provisioning and fail over because if a node goes down, you, you could take another node and just fill in for it, right? You, you know, I, if, I'm, if I'm designating some nodes to do some special operation, these other nodes do the other special operation, if I run out of nodes in sort of one category, I have to mainly go and say, okay, let me, let me take resources out of another one. Less of an issue now with the cloud because it's easy to spin up new, new instances. If you're running on-prem uh, in, in a non-virtualized environment, this is, this is harder to do. In a heterogeneous uh, cluster, the, all the nodes are assigned to specific tasks. Um, now, you may have a single physical node have multiple daemons or processes running at the same time that can do the different res responsibilities. Um, and then, you know, that avoids the network, ne network messages between them. Um, but again, at, at a really large scale, you want them to be uh, separate because each, each sort of task is, could be uh, very compute heavy. So to explain what, so sorry, the homogeneous one is pretty obvious to understand. But to give an example of what the heterogeneous one looks like, I want to give an example of uh, what MongoDB's architecture looks like. And I'll say that this is the MongoDB, this is like the version of MongoDB you run on-prem. They have their own cloud version, and they sort of hide all this for you. Uh, but if you download MongoDB and run it on your, on your, on your local machine uh, and it just should be set up, you, you would get something like this. So we have an application server. And it's going to send query requests to this, this special node called a router. And, and it would examine the query request and say, I want to get you know, the record with ID 101. So then it would go down to this thing they call the config server that's going to maintain its own internal state about where all the data is located uh, in the database. Right? What partition has or shard has, has the data you need. It sends the information back to the router who then, then now routes the query to the appropriate node that has the data that, that it needs, get back the result, and then you send it back to the client, right? And sort of this, there's this uh, transparency between the application and the database itself where it doesn't need to know how many partitions it has. It doesn't need to know where the partition is located, uh, how, you know, how much disk they have, and so forth. All that's hidden from you because right? the router thing is responsible for sending your request to the right location. So this is sort of clear. So you have different nodes that have special tasks. And so this is just repeating what I've already just said. We want this notion, we want to achieve what is called data transparency, where the application should not know anything about a distributed database, should not know how many nodes it has, should not know anything about where the, where the data is actually located. right? And any query that we'd run on a single node instance of our database should also run and, pr and produce the same result on, on a distributed database. Again, regardless of how, how, of how I scale things and change things, right? Now, in actuality, when, you build it, when you're building an application that's using distributed database, 
you kind of do need to be aware of where the where your data is actually located so you don't do stupid things like if i have to update two records uh and those two records are, are on different parts of the, of the world if i do it in a transaction then what's going to happen i then i have to do you know multiple round trips to coordinate over over the network going under the ocean between these 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 two you know these two data items in my database and that can be very very expensive or if I want to run a query that has, you know, that, that wants to scan a petabyte of data, I don't want to have to pull that petabyte of data from, you know, from Europe or Asia back in the U.S. and process it. Right? Ideally, I want the, you know, maybe I, I could send my request to the right, uh, sort of the, not the right node, but like the right, uh, right router thing that knows how to get data, you know, run queries on, on, on in that part of the world, right? So. What I'm just trying to say is we don't want to have special syntax or introduce any modifications to our SQL queries to say, hey, scan this, you know, run this query on this table located at this location, right? We want the database system to, to, to handle all that for you. But again, you need to be sort of aware where things, where, where the data is actually located to make sure you don't do, you know, you don't run things that are more expensive than they should be. So now we need to talk about partitioning because this is something that we've, uh, We've alluded to on a, when we talked about parallel execution, and I'm showing examples now where I have these different databases and they're being split up and queries are going to one location versus another. So now we need to talk about how we actually do, do the splitting. So the idea is that we want to split our, our data across the multiple resources that we have. Again, depending on its, if it's a shared disk or shared, shared nothing or shared everything, right? It could be splitting across, across different hard drives, different physical nodes, different CPUs, different uh, memory regions. Um, all I'm going to use the word partitioning, and because traditionally in the in academia and also for the relational databases, they refer to partitions. Uh, in the NoSQL world or, or on the Hacker News world, they're going to refer to refer to these as shards or sharding. The basic idea is the same: we're going to split the database up into to, to disjoint pieces. And the idea is that just like as we did on parallel parallel execution, where query shows up, we we generate the query plan, and then we want to break this up into uh, to physical fragments that we can then send to the different partitions uh, to run in parallel. It's, it's the same idea in a distributed database, and then we want to combine the results from the different fragments into a single answer. So the database system can be able to partition a database either physically, if it's a shared nothing system, or logically if it's shared shared disk, right? And again, it, it has to do with where the where the where the the final resting place or the, the primary storage location of the database is actually being stored. So let's go through a bunch of different examples of different type of partitioning schemes you can have, and then we'll discuss the trade-offs of actually having, trying to support these. So the easiest way to do uh, partitioning is just what is called naive table partitioning, where you take the entire table and assign it to a single node. Like if I have two tables, one goes to one node, and the other table goes to the other node, right? And this obviously assumes that you have enough storage space to store the entire table in each node, uh, assumes that most of your queries are going to only access one table at a time, Right, this would be terrible if they're joins. Um, and then, of course, and happens, what happens now if you add a new table? Where does that go? This, this complicates a bunch of things. But this is the easiest way to get uh, to split a database up. So it looked like this. So I have two tables, one and two. I literally, I literally take all the tuples from table one, store it in that node, and that's partition one. All the, t the tuples from table two, and that goes to, to this partition two here. Right? And the best case scenario for me in, in, for, this, for this arrangement is a t you know, every query only accesses one table. So very few systems will actually let you do this. Mongo is the one that, that I could think of um, where you could say this node, this table will be dedicated, or collection, they, they call it, this table will be dedicated to this single node. And they would do this for, um, they would do this for some cases where they, have, where they have applications that want to do maybe update the actual database itself, but then append like a log record into a table. And so you'd put that log table on a separate node. So you just blast the, the, the inserts over to that thing. And it didn't interfere with updating the actual database itself. Because you, ne you never went back and read the log unless you were doing like an audit later on. Another type of partitioning is called vertical partitioning. Uh, and the idea here is basically you want to sort of simulate a column store where you're going to take a table and split across its attributes. So all the, all the tuples for with all, all the values for, for some set of, subset of the attributes for all the tuples go to one partition, and all the, 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 the values for some other subset of our attributes go to another partition. Right, so say I have four tuples here, and they have four attributes. And say the, the last attribute, attribute four, 
is a large text field. So what I want to do is just break it up so that there's one partition that stores just the first three attributes, and then another partition stores the, the, the last attribute. And again, it's like a column store. I would have to know how to, you know, how to, course, how to map or combine them back together to produce the, the, the original uh, tuple. All right. What is more common uh, in, uh, in distributed databases is called horizontal partitioning. And the idea here is that we're going to split the, the tuples up into these subsets where all the attributes for that, for that tuple, all the columns, will be stored together contiguously on, 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 on the partition. Well, it doesn't have to be contiguously. If it's column store, you can still do the same thing. But like, if I want to get the, all, the, the, all the values for a single tuple, it's going to be on one, on one partition. right? And the challenge here is that we want to try to pick a partitioning key and a partitioning scheme, the mechanism we're going to use to divide things up, in a way that's going to divide the database equally across the, the different nodes by some metric, right? The, uh, the storage size, how much, how much work or how much queries are going to get sent to them, uh, how often they're going to update it, and so forth. So picking the right partitioning scheme is actually an MP complete problem, and there's a bunch of research on how to do this automatically. Oftentimes, for OLTP, it's, it's quite obvious. Like the, it's usually the, the, the schema is a tree structure, like customer ID, like you have a customer account, customer orders, customer order items. Uh, you would partition the, the database or those tables on the customer ID. For OLAP, it's, it's, it's a bit harder, as we'll see next week, because I could be doing joins across any arbitrary keys, and you know one partitioning scheme for one query may be the best, but another part, it could be the worst for another set of queries. So if trying to figure this out is, is non-trivial. So I've already shown sort of range partitioning already, right? There's, you know, there's some partitioning key, there's a, some column. I'll say, you know, from 0 to 100 goes in one partition, and 0 to 101 to 200 goes in another partition. Oftentimes, though, hash partitioning is, is, is widely used. Predicate partitioning is not that common. Basically, think of like a where clause for any tuple that you then would use that to figure out what, you know, almost like, a, like a, a routing table to say where that tuple actually would go. It's usually hash partitioning or range partitioning. And then between those two, hash partitioning is usually more common, especially in OLTP workloads or the NoSQL systems. All right, so let's see how to do this hash partitioning for this table here. So the first thing we got to do is pick a partitioning key. So say we pick the second column here, and we're going to do hash partitioning. So we have four partitions. So what we're going to do is we're going to take, uh, take the value for each tuple for this, for this column here, run our hash function, right, xx hash, whatever one we want, Mod it by the number of, of nodes that we have, uh, partitions we have, and then that's going to determine where this data goes, right? And then and they be split up into partitions like this. So now any query that comes along, and, and in their where clause, they have an, an quality predicate that is doing a lookup on exactly our, our, partitioning, our partitioning key column. We just take this value they're passing in, hash that, mod it by four, like we're doing an example here. And that tells what node we, has the data that we want. And this, again, this is something the database system does. It's not, you, you wouldn't do this in your application. Uh, the data system would figure this out for you. So is this clear? OK, so now let's talk about the difference between logical partitioning and, and physical partitioning. So in a shared disk system, logical partitioning means it basically is, it, it's, it's a way to denote what node is responsible for processing the data or the queries that touch the data within some partition, right? So say we have out on our, on our storage device, we have a bunch of, uh, we have four values. Uh, and then now there'll be some metadata we keep track of at each node that says, I'm responsible for, you know, for IDs within this range or things that hash, hash to me. So now when the application server says, I want to get ID one, right? There could be something up in front, front of this that tells how to route there. We can ignore that for now. But say it goes here, and this guy knows I'm responsible for this, so I, know I'm, I can go to disk and get it. Right? This guy wants to get ID3, same thing. He's responsible. He can go do that. And so now if I want to get multiple ones, as I showed before, we have this decision where we, we know that this node can't, doesn't have ID equals 2. And so rather than going just to disk, disk, going out to disk and getting it, because then everyone has a, could potentially have a copy, and that would be a problem if I want to do an update, where do I go to update it? How do I tell everyone I've updated it? We could have this thing say, well, I'm not responsible for, for ID equals 2, so let me send a query request, 
or the data request up to this node, and that node could either send me the result of the query or the actual data that I want, and I just maintain an ephemeral copy, and then I send the result back there. Physical partitioning in, uh, in shared nothing is where, again, the, the data is actually physically located. So just like before, I'm splitting up on ID. So when I want to get ID equal 1, I know to go up here and get it. That's fine. Uh, when I want to get ID 3, I go down here and get it, and, th and that's fine. Right? And then if I, if I do the same uh, message passing as before, if, if the bottom guy wants to get ID equals 2, then I can either send the query request or the data request, and I can have a local copy at the node on the bottom. OK. So let's go back to this example here. Um, so again, we were doing hash partitioning on the second column here, where I take the value for each for this value, take the value for this column for each tuple, hash it, mod four, and then uh, that tells me where, where the partition will actually be stored. What's the problem with this approach? Yes. As you add four nodes or remove nodes, you have to move a lot of stuff. Bingo. He said as you add 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 new nodes or remove nodes. You have to move stuff around. So if I add a new new node here, right, then I can't mod four anymore because I have five part, I have five five nodes or five partitions. So I got to go ahead and rehash everything, which is going to require me to shuffle everything around, right? Now range partitioning, you can you can excise the ranges, and that that's sort of you can, you can play a trick there. But if you're using hash partitioning, this won't work, right? You have to mod, re remod everyone again, right? So the solution to this problem is actually called what is called consistent hashing. Who here has heard of consistent hashing before? Less than half, less than 25%. Okay. So consistent hashing is a really neat technique, and it's widely used in, in both distributed databases, mostly for on the operational side, operational systems, less for OLAP, uh, but certainly distributed systems in general. Uh, it's a technique to basically avoid this reshuffling problem. And it was developed by, at MIT in the early 2000s. So the, the way to think about it is that the, the hash range uh, for for you know some some partitioning key, is going to be represented in, in this circle from zero to one, and the idea is that we're going to hash uh, the data that we have. You know we want to sort each partition. We're going to hash it and then map it to this circle here. So say partition one is this part in the ring, partition two is down here, and partition three is over here. So now when I want to do a lookup and say go get me ID equal one hundred one or whatever the key is, I'm going to hash it. Uh, then it's going to land somewhere in the ring. And then I just move forward in the ring to say, what's the closest, uh, what's the closest partition uh, in my, you know, where, based on my location where I'm in the ring? What's the closest partition to me going in, in clockwise order? And that's where my data is going to be stored. right? So I land here in the ring, and I would scan down and say, oh, P1 is actually what I want. right? Likewise, if I do another hash over here, I land in this part of the ring, slide up, P3 has the data that you want. So the way to think about this is like the, these partitions are going to cover the key space for the, or, or the hash ring from the point where they're located around to the, where the next, the next node is. All right? All right, so so far, this seems pretty OK. This is fine. What, what makes this special? Well, when I have a new partition show up here, uh, the only thing I need to do now is just move the data that was used to be covered by the, the next partition above me in the ring, I, since I'm excising or splitting in half, all the data over here from, from P4 to P2 that used to be in P3, well, it only needs to move to get moved to P4. All the data in the other partitions don't have to move at all. all right? Again, it's the same thing. I add, I add another partition, P5 here. That splits the, the range from P3 to P1. I only need to move the data from P1 that, uh, uh, that, that falls at this point in the ring. Same thing, I had P2, I only move that data. So I'm not, I don't have to reshuffle the whole, whole, the whole ring, or the whole partitioning scheme. Um, the, the change or modification is, is localized to just that part of the ring. OK, so how do I find data now? So in, to have better availability, which we'll cover more in the next class, uh, I actually want to store the data across multiple nodes or multiple partitions, right? So you would have this notion of a, of a replication factor, meaning like for every single time I insert a new record into the database, I'm going to store it on three different nodes or three, three different partitions. So let's say uh, any data that I would store in P1 here, 
I'm also going to store them in the next two nodes in the ring, so P6 and P2. So now when I, when I want to do a lookup and say, go find me key, key one, I'm going to hash it. It lands here in the ring. Uh, and then I know I could either go fetch it at P1, P6, or P2. And all of them would, would, would potentially have the data that I'm, that I'm looking for. Of course, this makes writes more complicated, right? How do I make sure that if I write something to P1, it gets to P6 and P2? Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that uh, next class. You either wait for all of them to acknowledge it, or you can wait for a majority to, to acknowledge, depending on your, uh, your tolerance. So as I said, this, 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 there's a very influential paper in the early, early 2000s from MIT called CORD that invented this technique. Um, but then most famously, Amazon picked up this idea and they implemented it in Dynam DynamoDB in the, the late 2000s. Um, there's another system called MemcacheD, which is a, like an in-memory distributed hash table for, for caching things. It's basically a database system. They use this. Uh, Cassandra was written by Facebook originally to power their mailbox. Uh, the guy that founded Cloudera wrote Cassandra at Facebook for the, for the mail. Facebook says, we don't want to use this. So then they, they threw it away and made it open source. So Facebook never used Cassandra, even though they wrote it. Then a bunch of other people picked it up. And then React is, a, is or was a distributed key value store. I, I think it's still around. The, the company backing it went under. Um, but you can see in their logo, they have this, the ring, and they're doing that sort of three, three replication thing that I showed before. Right? Because it's a, it's, a, it's a key value store that's using a consistent hashing scheme like this. By Dynamo rather than DynamoDB, right? Uh, so this question is, do I mean Dynamo versus DynamoDB? DynamoDB is the public commercial version of Dynamo. This is totally different from Dynamo. Right from scratch or the design? From the design. And that I'll double check. They, they never published. They just wrote a paper this year about the DynamoDB design, but they didn't talk about consistent hashing. OK. I'll double check that. OK. So yeah, the original Dynamo paper from 2009 does, or 2007 does this. I'll double check that. We should cover that in the advanced class. Good. Okay. All right. So, um, so now, so, so in this example here, when I said, okay, I do a write, I want to write the data to three locations, right? Uh, this now gets us into the world of how do we make sure that when we do updates. Those, those updates get applied to multiple nodes, and everything is it's like safe and durable. Um, and so now we have this notion of, of a, well, a, you know, of what's the sort of the scope of the transaction, meaning how much data or how many nodes we're actually going to have to touch. And again, this doesn't matter where it's a, it's a, whether it's shared disk or uh, shared nothing. Uh, if the data is being located or either logically or physically partitioned at different nodes, right? I got to coordinate across them when I do an update, so it happens atomically. Um, so if a transaction only needs to touch data at a single partition, it's, it's obviously like, you know, a single partition transaction, a single node transaction. And this is the best case scenario because potentially I don't need to coordinate the, the commit process of that transaction with other nodes in the system, right? Because the data it touched was only at that single partition. I don't care what other, what other data, other nodes, or what data other transactions running on other nodes modify because I only care about what's, what's local to me. Right, that's the best case scenario. And you want to ideally pick a partitioning key, if, you're, if it's an OTP system, that maxes mi maximizes the number of, of single partition or single node transactions. And oftentimes, you actually can do this. Right? If you think about like my example of using the customer ID as the partitioning key for a table, uh, when you go log into Amazon, you can only update things to, to, to your table or you know, your customer record, your, your account. Right? You're not updating all the people's accounts. So, if your data is partitioned such that all your information is on a single node, you would get a single node transaction. Right? And that's the, that's the best case scenario. A distributed transaction would be when, where the transaction. DJ uh, Mushu? Uh, do I know you? You've been served. Holy sh. Yeah? I, th I thought I was in the clear, man. Okay. Are you sure they didn't like reach out to you? They I'm, how did it. they know I was here? Did you narc on me? I didn't say anything. You didn't snitch on no. me? Are you sure? You're not gonna read it? I, right, didn't wait. I mean I'm sure it's just they, they're suing me for child support, but like <laughs> Okay. Alright, uh
Yeah, OK. Uh, um, all right, transactions. <laughs> right, so uh, again, I I if a transaction has to touch multiple, multiple things, that's a distributed transaction, and that gets very expensive, right? Uh, and we'll, we'll focus a little bit more on this in the next class. But the, the question is now how, who's actually going to coordinate these transactions, right? Whether it's two-phase commit or sorry, two-phase locking or OCC, it doesn't matter. We still need somebody to say, okay, this transaction is committing. Like, let's let's go ahead and do it. Um, and the the two approaches to have a sort of centralized uh, centralized coordinator or a decentralized coordination between the nodes themselves. Um, the centralized one it probably is historically more common. Um, it's again things get blurry because. Uh, the way the way these, these systems sort of work now is it's a decentralized coordination, but they run a leader election like Paxos or RAF to say who is actually the coordinator. So it is become essentially become centralized. But in theory, if that leader crashes and goes down, you elect a new leader. So it's not a clean dichotomy, but it's, I want to cover b both ideas. All right. So, so a centralized uh, coordinator, uh, the the first version of this would, was are typically called TP monitors. Um, TP would some uh, now it stands for transaction processing. In the old days, I think it stands for the telecom processing because they, they would build these, these sort of centralized transaction coordinators for distributed databases to manage things like people calling on the phone, uh, keeping track of call records, or like ATM machines and so forth. Right? So they built these early TP monitors back in the 1970s. And, and like, the idea was you had these single node databases that could do transactions locally on the data that it had, right? similar to what you're building in BusTub. But now if I want to touch multiple, multiple database systems and run transactions across all of them at the same time, I need this like, centralized coordinator to right? sort of, sort of you know, be a god above them and decide who can do what. And so they built these in the 1970s. A lot of these things are still around today. Uh, so most famously for, like I think, American Airlines, they built a system called Sabre that uses uh, TP Monitor that they still use today uh, to, to coordinate airline reservations. In the 1990s, there was an attempt to standardize the, the sort of the protocol for committing transactions between uh, these different nodes, um, and called XA or XOpen. Uh, you few newer systems don't support this, but like the enterprise systems like Oracle and DB2 could do this. So the idea is you could take a again you could take a single node Oracle database, have multiple runs running at the same time, use a TP monitor, and they can, they can coordinate with each other using this this TP monitor over the XA protocol. So the idea looks like this, right? So we have an application server. So before it's allowed to go touch data on any partition, uh, and say it wants to touch partitions one and three, uh, it has to go to this coordinator and say, I'm going to need this data at these partitions. Let me go ahead and lock them, right? And then the coordinator is, has, the, the, has the lock table, like you guys are building in Project 4, that can keep track of who holds the lock for, for what data. Uh, so it gets a, you know, makes the lock request. Once it's granted the lock, then it gets acknowledgment. Then it goes. The application server can then go out to uh, the different nodes, do whatever it needs to do to, to run the queries, do the updates. But now, when it wants to commit, it goes back to the coordinator and says, "Hey, I want to I want to commit." The coordinator knows how to talk to the different nodes and say, "Hey, is this is, this guy wants to commit? He touched you. Are you allowed to do this?" Uh, and if yes, then it'll do the commit and get the acknowledgement back. Now, what this wire protocol, this part here, like how do we say it's safe to commit? Get everyone to agree and then commit. That's Paxos, Raft, or two phase commit, which we'll cover next class. All right. So this TP monitor, there's 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 a bunch of older systems out there that uh, that 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 do this. BEA had this thing called Tuxedo that they bought from uh, they bought from AT and T because they built one of these first ones in the 1980s, and then Oracle bought them, and it's, you can still get Tuxedo today. Um, TransArc actually came out of CMU, uh, came out of the AFS project. It was like a TP monitor for doing distributed transactions. And then IBM bought them uh, late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you're an ISR or whatever the, the software engineering department is called now, there's a guy, Jeff Eppinger. He was the, he was the, the founder of, of TransArc. And then IBM bought them. And then this is hard to read. It's a terrible logo. But this is OMID. Uh, this is a TP monitor or a transaction coordinator for, uh, for HBase. Um, that came out of Yahoo Labs. And it, it's an open source project, Apache project, that I think is still available today. Right? So again, the idea here is that the, there's this coordinator on the side. The application has to know that there's a coordinator. It has to go to the coordinator and say, hey, can I do something? 
coordinator says yes or no, and then you then send your request directly to, to directly to the partitions or the nodes, right? What is more common is to have a middleware as a centralized coordinator, where the application doesn't know about the partitions, doesn't know about these nodes. It always sends requests to the middleware, and it, it, it has its own lock tables and management and everything, and then it can just send the request to uh, the different nodes as, as needed, right? And then when, once it wants to go to commit, you, go to, you ask the coordinator for the middleware, can I commit? And then like before, it goes and asks the different nodes, am I allowed to do this, right? And again, the, the, the advantage of this one is that the, this handles the query routing, this handles the transactions, right? The application doesn't need to know what's, what's behind it. So there's a bunch of open source systems that do this. The test came out of YouTube uh, to, to basically a middleware in front of uh, MySQL. And they do this now, uh, plan at scale, then, then commercialize this. I sort of showed the example of MongoDB. They worked sort of this way. Um, this is what Google did in the early days with sharding MySQL. This is what Facebook does now with MySQL. eBay did this with Oracle, right? There's a, there's a bunch of people that, that, that do this, right? Okay. The one that's sort of again, more common or again, it blurs the line between a middleware and, and, or a centralized coordinator and a decentralized coordinator. Um, for decentralized coordination, the idea is that the, the application server will, will send a begin request to start a transaction to some partition, right, some node in our cluster. This guy then gets anointed as the leader, and it's responsible for determining whether this transaction is allowed to commit or not. And if it does, it's not allowed to commit, to tell everyone that, that to roll back and make sure everyone is in agreement that this thing has to commit or not. So now the application could send a query request into individual partitions, or it could go through the leader. It doesn't matter. But then again, when it goes to commit, it asks the leader, can I do this? They all have to agree, and then, then you send back the deposit. Again, we'll, we'll discuss next class what that, uh, what that protocol actually is. Yes? This question is, can the leader be any, any node? Uh, in theory, it could be anyone, yes. Yes. Is only one? Is that considered? Is that So, statement is when you're using Redshift, you have one leader node. You send all your requests to that, right? And then it is responsible for, for for dispatching them to the different things. Right. That, that's the middleware approach. Oh, okay. Yeah. But then, but isn't that what it's saying? Kind of like I'm confused. How is this decentralized? I guess. How is this decentralized? Because another transaction could be sending could start a transaction at P3. The P3 is the leader for that transaction. Oh, okay, okay. But now you got to deal with like, I'm the leader, you're the leader, you're doing one thing, I'm doing something else, and we got we to coordinate. Right? Yes? So you run leader election per transaction? So his question is, do you run leader election per transaction? No, you would run, like, you would have leases. Because otherwise, if you're running Paxos leader election, then committing your transaction, it's kind of redundant. It's wasteful. Yes? Does each partition do their own concurrency control or the leader is yes. the coordinator? So his statement is, does each transaction do its own concurrency control, or does the leader do it for you? So I could have two transactions hit up P3 and, and, with, and without any other node, and you, you would have to run two-base locking, whatever you want, locally as well, right? It's just you need to be aware of, okay, well, like somebody else is also updating data to this thing at this, this, this node here, and their they're, they're leader is up above. So I need to make sure I'm aware of that. Yeah, same. But if I'm doing centralized coordinator, since everything everything goes through the at least the middleware, if everything is going through the middleware, uh -huh. the middleware it depends. It could be like coarse grain locks. Like I have a I have locks on a, a portion of the partition, uh, and then for individual like tuple level locks, you you still do that locally, right? So again, this is like it's two phase locking distributed, but then also on on the local node you do two phase locking as well. And the reason why you have to ask whether it's safe to commit because you could be sending query, you're sending SQL requests over. Let's go back. Let me go back to the centralized one because I think we're clear. Um, like the application could have sent SQL requests over. The middleware says, "Well, I know how to route it to the location that has the data you want, but I don't actually know what you did, right? Because it's like it's, you look at the where clause, but in like the set clause, if it's an update, it might do something like." Set, a, set somebody's uh, you know, age to a negative value, and then there's an integrity constraint that says that's not allowed to commit. 
So you have to make sure that like, okay, I know you did something here. Did this transaction fail or not? And if it failed, you have to tell everyone else that you failed. And, and, and the middleware would handle that for you. Okay. All right, so the last thing I said I wanted to cover is distributed currency control. And I, I've been alluding to all this, and this will be what we'll talk about next week. Um, ideally, we want to have multiple transactions be able to execute simultaneously across different nodes at the same time. Doesn't matter whether it's shared disk or shared, shared, shared nothing, right? We, we want to be able to handle this. Um, and so we need to make sure now we want to have all the same asset guarantees that we spent the last three weeks talking about for our single node database. We want them to, to carry over to our, uh, to our distributed database, right? Of course, this is going to be a lot harder, as I said before, because now we've got to worry about the network, the cost of sending that messages, messages not arriving at all. Uh, we have to deal with ma machines going down and crashing. What happens then, right? Um, if we're using like clocks for t for the timestamps, if we're doing like timestamp ordering, or even multi versioning, or using the timestamp to keep track of like you know who started first versus another, how do I actually keep the, the the clock in sync with different nodes running at the same time? That's super hard, right? And then and then we'll talk about also now since I want to have high availability, I don't want it to be the case where if one node goes down, I, my whole database goes down because now I, I'm, I'm missing data. I want to be able to do replication where I, I update data. I write data to one, to one node and it gets propagated to other nodes. Right? Shared disk solves that problem in some ways, uh, but if you're doing shared nothing, you have, you have to worry about this, right? So let's see why this is hard. So say we want to do distributed TPL. We have two uh, nodes that are separated by some network, uh, and the node one has a, has a single key A, node two has a single key B. So at exactly the same time, these two transactions start running. They don't know about each other at this point. The first guy wants to update A, the second guy wants to update B. So we just run a local two-phase locking, no, no big deal. They both get the exclusive lock on, on the two objects, right? That's fine. But now they want to, uh, the, the first guy wants to update B, the other guy wants to update A, but the system knows that this data is not local, it's on the other node. So it's got to send a lock request over the network uh, back and forth. And we have the classic deadlock that, that we had to deal with uh, from before. All right, so we know how to do deadlock detection, right? This is just a wait for graph, right, to figure out who's waiting for who and are they, you know, it, it, is it ne never going to get released? But now the problem is I got to send, I got to coordinate between these different nodes because they have their own notion of who's waiting for what. Someone's got to run deadlock detection. And someone's got to tell somebody who's, who's going to die. But like if, say the, the message gets lost or say like uh, they both try to do the same thing, they both try to kill each other and then like, you know, nothing ever gets done, right? It's the same algorithm, but everything's just harder because now the network's unreliable, the network is slow, and the state of the system is split across two different, you know, geographical regions. Now the centralized coordinator solves this in some ways, but you still have the problems of, you know, communicating between different nodes and say, hey, are we allowed to do this, yes or no? So just because you have a centralized coordinator doesn't make this, that doesn't make all the problems go away. Likewise, with shared disk, doesn't make all the problems go, go away. Okay? All right, so just to sort of finish up, uh, and then we'll talk about project four. So I barely scratched the surface on distributed database systems. Again, next week will be all about first doing for OTP and doing for OLAP. And as, as oftentimes as I say in, in this class, it's hard to get this right. This is why you don't want random JavaScript programmers writing their own distributed database which they often do, right? I had that centralized coordinator thing, uh, the, the middleware. People actually build that thing a lot inside their application. Like in their application code, they'll say, okay, well, I hash the thing I'm looking up on, and that'll tell me which database connection I go to, right? They're basically doing sharding internally in their application. In my opinion, that's a bad idea. You don't want to do that. You want to use a, you want to use a database system. In most cases, most people probably don't need a distributed database at all. Like 99% of the applications out there don't need a distributed database. Replication, yes, and we'll cover that next class, but most people don't need a sort of a horizontally scale out distributed database. Wait, that's, in that case, when, do you, when, when should you be considering distributed database? So his question is, when should you be considering a distributed database? My answer would be, if, if, you're, if you're doing a startup and you, you cannot scale vertically Postgres anymore, 
because you, you have a lot of data, you have a lot of operations, a lot of, a lot of transactions. At that point, you have money, and then you pay either for me or for him or somebody, <laughs> probably him, uh, somebody to come and like tell you what to do, right? But most startups, when they start off, can get by with a you know post a well-tuned Postgres running on a single box, with replication, for for availability, right? Most people like. The NoSQL stuff, a lot of that came out because uh, people started building these things because it's what Google did. And Google was super, is and was super successful in the 2000s, and certainly now. Like, a lot of people try to say, oh, Google, they're making a lot of money. They have a bunch of scale buddy problems. I'm going to be the next Google. I have the same kind of problems. And they started trying to make their own versions of Bigtable and other things that Google was building internally. But a lot of the design decisions that Google made were right for Google, but not right for a lot of people. So people were sort of unnecessarily building complex systems that they probably didn't need to. Sort of reinventing the wheel for a lot of things. Okay. All right, project four. Project four is out. Uh, and what you guys will be doing is adding support for transactions, doing two-phase locking in bus top. And so you're going to do deadlock detection, uh, hierarchical locking, just with tables and tuples, no page locks. Um, you have to support multiple isolation levels. I don't think we require serializability because that requires extra steps, so we're not going to do that. Um, and you have to support transaction rollbacks and, and aborts, or rolling back data because of aborts. So you do not need to worry about doing right ahead logging in, in, your, in, in the system. So we essentially are doing A, A and I, atomicity and isolation for your transactions. We're not doing durability. In consistency, we, we don't worry about it as well. Okay. So there's three tasks. That should be project four, not three. The first one, the lock manager, again, you're going to maintain the internal lock table and then and the queues of what transactions are waiting for what locks. Uh, you need to keep track of what phase they are in in two-phase locking. And then when a transaction is waiting for a lock, you need a way to notify the transaction to wake up and unblock them and then let them acquire, acquire the lock. You also need to support lo uh, lock upgrades as well, which I'm missing from this. You have to build a deadlock detector. It's going to maintain its own weights for a graph and then have a deterministic protocol for identifying what transactions you want to kill. And I'm underlying the, the, term, the, the term or the word deterministically because you want it to be the case that for every single, for every sort of arrangement of transactions, who's waiting for who, you want to make sure you kill the, the same transaction over and over again because that's how the, the test cases will check for things. Right? If you're flipping a coin, then it'll unlock something that the test doesn't expect. And then you need to modify your execution engine for project three to. Uh, update like the sequential scan and the index scan, I think the insert uh, uh, executors to now support transactions. Okay? You don't need you don't need a lock you don't need to lock tuples in your hash your your your, your, your nested loop join operator because you've already scanned the data at that point. Right? You assume that that the access method below that already already acquired the locks to read the data. Again, should be project four leaderboard, not three, but the we have a new we have a new SQL benchmark. Uh, that does a bunch of more stuff than, than what you maybe saw in Project 3. Um, so we're going to use this benchmark as a way to measure the performance of your system. So now we're looking some more holistically at the entire thing, uh, who can build the fastest one uh, while doing transactions. It's a simulation of an uh, NFT scam. So uh, if you're into that, you, you, you'll enjoy it. All right, just like before, you only want to submit the, the, the files that we tell you to submit on Gradescope. Only modify them. Make sure you pull the latest changes. And as always, come to uh, post your questions on Piazza, come to the Q&A session tonight, uh, or come to Office Hours. And then again, you can compare your solution against the uh, uh, against bus up in the browser. Don't plagiarize. Or we'll mess you up, OK? All right, so next class, we'll talk about more distributed OTP systems, replication, the CAP theorem, and then more real-world examples. Get in. Done and get it over with Cause the whole world's waiting for another
of the dead town street sound. Clown a motherfucker if you label me a fake. I'm like a cobra and I'm down with the super snake. 